Thank you so much for being here. My name is Liz McGill. I'm the Dean of Stanford Law School, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Morrison Enforcer Lecture in honor of Marshall Small, a graduate of the law school from 1951. I want to first thank Morrison Enforcer for their generosity in endowing this lectureship in 2004 to honor Marshall's more than 50-year career with the firm, where he was a partner from 1961 to 1992 and has been senior counsel since then. This lecture brings distinguished academics, practitioners, jurists, regulatory officials in the field of law, economics, and business to campus to deliver public lectures to Stanford Law School's faculty, students, alumni, and friends from the community. It is a special emphasis owing to Marshall's career on topics in corporate governance and practice to recognize the career devoted to developing best practices in this area. Let me tell you a little bit about Marshall Small, who we are privileged to say is with us this evening. He's uh, received his undergraduate degree Phi Beta Kappa from Stanford University. Then he attended the law school, where he served as notes editor and received many academic honors. After receiving his law degree from Stanford, he clerked for Justice William O. Douglas on the United States Supreme Court during the 1951 term of that court. He went on to a storied and very distinguished career known to many of you in this room. Let me just give you a few highlights. Uh, he served as reporter for the American Law Institute's Corporate Governance Project. He served as a member of the American Bar Foundation's Committee on Corporate Laws, where he participated in the presentation of that committee's original Corporate Director's Guidebook and the Overview Committees of Board of Directors. Remarkably, he continues, after this incredible career, to contribute his insights to the law, law school and to the field of corporate governance. He currently serves as an advisor to the Rock Center on Corporate Governance. Tonight, we honor Mr. Small with a lecture from Kenneth Feinberg, who has been called in to design compensation alternatives to resolve many of our nation's most challenging and widely known disputes arising out of both corporate governance failures as well as many national tragedies. Kenneth Feinberg is the founding and managing partner of the law offices of Kenneth Feinberg. The Wall Street Journal dubbed him Mr. Fairness and the nation's arbitrator in chief. And this is with good reason. In addition to the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, he's managed the victims funds in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombing, the Virginia Tech, and Aurora, Colorado shootings. He also served as President Obama's pay czar, administering the TARP Executive Compensation Fund, also as the claims administrator of BP's $20 billion oil spill fund, and most recently as the administrator of the General Motors Ignition Compensation Fund. A 2010 Boston Globe editorial praising Feinberg for, quote, handling tough assignments with skill and with little fuss, and maybe more importantly, for winning broad acceptance of the soundness of his conclusions. The Globe editorial went on to lament that there is, quote, exactly one person with a credibility to mediate these complex and highly politicized disputes. And the editorial pleaded that if scientists ever perfect human cloning, they should make copies of Kenneth Feinberg. As far as we know, even scientists at Stanford have not yet figured out how to clone him. So we are incredibly grateful to have the one and only Kenneth Feinberg with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming him. I'm going to take care of two small logistical matters so Mr. Feinberg does not have to do so. Uh, he has graciously agreed to take some questions after his talk. If you are going to ask a question, please come to the microphones to ask the questions. And the second point is, as is typical in these events, we'll try to give some preference to students who have questions for Mr. Feinberg. Thank, thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to thank the dean uh, for that uh, kind introduction. I know that Globe editorial by heart. <laughs> and uh, I try it out every once in a while. I'm really here for two reasons tonight, uh, 3,000 miles from home. First, I'm here because it's Stanford. And this is my third visit to Stanford in the last six or seven years. And any time I get an invitation from Stanford, uh, it comes with a great deal of credibility. And I'm excited to be here even for a very short time. Second, I'm here because of Marshall Small. And um, when you're invited to give the small lecture 
uh, and um, to pay a great deal of respect to a great American and have him here, present, it's a very special honor, very special, part of a great law firm, and uh, I'm just honored to be invited. So, Mr. Small, I thank you for the invitation as well. Uh, by the way, if you uh, have a chance to corner Marshall Small and have him regale you, as I did for about 30 minutes, on what it was like to clerk for Justice Douglas in the 1951 term, uh, the McCarthy period, etc., and to get a first-hand account of what it was like clerking for Douglas, Justice Douglas in those, those difficult times. Um, it's like an oral history. It was just fabulous. Worth, worth coming to Stanford, actually. Now, my talk it raises some interesting issues, but I must tell you they're not really particularly important issues for lawyers. They're important issues for uh, the American citizen, the American people. Um, there's a special affinity for what I do if you're a historian, not a lawyer. And there's a real affinity if you have a background not in law, but in a school of divinity or psychiatry, because what I do is a precedent for nothing. It's not going to change America, what I do. These programs that the dean references, like the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, or the BP Oil Spill Fund, or the GM Ignition Switch Program, they are precedents for nothing. They are aberrations. They are rare, they are, are um, seldom invoked, seldom used as an example, and I wouldn't give too much um, credence to the notion that they're the wave of the future, because they are not the wave of the future. They are real exceptions. Now you see what happens is something like this. Every once in a while in American life, there is a tragedy. And the tragedy so overwhelms the American people, so galvanizes the public, that our elected officials decide there's got to be a better way to compensate innocent victims. They shouldn't have to hire a lawyer and go to court and litigate with all of the delays and the uncertainties and the costs. Instead, for this tragedy, and only this tragedy, we ought to come up with a streamlined way to compensate without lawyers, roll of the dice in the courtroom, litigation, bomb throwers, etc. Thirteen days after 9-11, Congress passed a law, a federal law, signed by President Bush. And that law said anybody who died on 9-11 as a result of the terrorist attacks or who were physically injured, the airplanes, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. If you are eligible, you may come into a no-fault legislative compensation program funded entirely by the taxpayer. Not the insurance company, not the World Trade Center, not the airlines, not Boeing, not the Port Authority of New York or Boston. The taxpayer the taxpayer, and you will be very generously compensated, tax-free. Now, you don't have to. You can go and litigate if you want. But if you'd rather come in and within 60 days get, on average, for a death claim, $2 million tax-free, come on in. 
Physical injury claim on average, $400,000. $7.1 billion in taxpayer money in 33 months, the 9-11 fund. It worked. A fabulous success. I defend the 9-11 fund every day. I think it worked exactly as Congress intended. All but 3% of the victims came into the fund. 97% entered the fund voluntarily. It worked. Don't ever do it again. Don't ever pass a law like that again. You should have read some of the emails I got when I was administering that fund. Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son died in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. My daughter died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attacks committed by the very same people. Why aren't I entitled to a check? And it wasn't just terrorism, you see. Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River. And then she drowned a heroine. Where's my check? You better be careful in America in setting up very generous compensation programs just for these people. Everybody else, fend for yourself. Fend for yourself. Now, bad things happen to good people every day in this country. There's no 9-11 fund. A country historically built on self-reliance, on independence, on egalitarianism. For you people, public compensation. Now, I think I defend the law. At the time, Congress responded to an unprecedented national calamity rivaled, I think, only by the American Civil War, Pearl Harbor, and the assassination of President Kennedy. That's it. And 9-11 was so unique and so glaring in the public eye, we wanted to show the world we take care of our own, our sense of community, of compassion, of charity. Very sound. Very sound. But it's a one-off. Don't have the government and the taxpayer fund compensation programs for innocent victims. Unless you're going to just do a complete 180 in the way that we compensate victims of tragedy in this country, you see. BP, Gulf oil spill, fabulous program. In 16 months, we volunt uh, voluntarily, volunteers came into the program. You didn't have to. In 16 months, six and a half billion dollars paid out. 220,000 releases from individuals and businesses. Fabulous program. Fabulous. Now, I don't think you'll see that again either. I mean, maybe some company will want to front $20 billion without even the first trial on liability even being scheduled and we had already poured out $6.5 billion paid 550,000 claims now BP that was some experience we received in the BP case in 16 months 1,200,000 claims from 50 states. I bought 400 claims from California. I didn't know the oil had got to California. 400 claims from California. Most ineligible. We received claims from 35 foreign countries. I was getting claims from Norway, China, Nigeria, Japan. 35 foreign countries, all claiming injury, economic loss, due to the oil spill. 
So, I mean, it's a wonderful um, um, example of corporate generosity, I must say, and corporate um, strategy as to how to resolve an unprecedented national calamity. But, I mean, I haven't seen a corporation since put up that type of money. General Motors, General Motors decided for political reasons and financial, let's resolve as many of these ignition switch alleged cover-up cases as we can. And we can't do it. We make automobiles. We're not in the claims business. So that one, Congress leaning on GM. GM set up the program. We'll be through with that program by the end of the year, another month or so. 400 eligible deaths and physical injuries due to alleged um, circumstantial evidence, at least, of ignition switch failure. Now, the people in this room understand the important distinction between those three programs, which are all cousins of one another, 9-11, BP, GM true alternatives to the tort system. If you decide to take money from any of those programs, you sign a piece of paper, I will not sue. This is instead of a lawsuit. So 97% of the people take the money in, in 9-11, 92% take the money in BP, and it's going to be about 92% that take the money in GM. The other people sue, if they want, and they settle their cases. 9 11, 94 people decided to sue. All 94 settled their cases five years later in court. There was never a trial in the 9 11 case. Never. There was no apology, and there never will be, and there was no trial. So people came in and got the money from me, or they got the money from the airlines five years later. There it is. BP, 92% settled. I left. After I left, BP went ahead and settled a class action, and as you know, all sorts of litigation ensued. I warned them. I said, 92% are gone. Be careful what you do. Well, they did what they did. GM, Virtually all of the eligible claimants took the money. Now, those programs are very, very different from some of the other programs referenced by the dean that I've been involved in. One Fund Boston, after the Boston Marathon bombings. Virginia Tech, the deranged student, shoots and kills 32 students and faculty. Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, the, the 25 first graders that are killed by some deranged um, young man. Aurora, Colorado, the movie shooting, the Dark Knight movie shooting. Some guy walks in and starts shooting everybody in the movie theater, kills 12, injures another 30 or 40 people. Now, all of those compensation programs have nothing to do with the tort system. Nothing. They're a gift. People watch on CNN or MSNBC from around the country. They see what happens. They send in money. Pay to the order of the victims of Virginia Tech. Pay to the order of Boston Marathon. Pay the in the Boston Marathon bombings, in 60 days, um, um, $61 million came in. $61 million, private money. Checks, $10, $20, $100, $1,000. $100, 100,000 people in America gave $61 million. It has nothing to do with the tort system. It's a 501c3 deduction. You give your money, and Feinberg distributes the money. It's a gift. It's not the tort system. Now, those programs, I mean... You learn in what I do, never underestimate the charitable impulse of the American people. It is astounding to me. 
astounding how the American people will witness some tragedy and send in money. I've become a nationally known philanthropist with other people's money. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, the money comes in, and I don't, I'm not the guy that says, let's have a program. I get, I get asked by the president or the attorney general or a governor or a mayor. We've got this money. We want to set it up. We want to get people compensated. So you do it. It's not rocket science what I do. There are people in this room, Michael and Klausner and others, that could do exactly what I do. I got the private tour from Michael today of, the, of this, oh, this place. Who wants to go home? Um, I, and it, not just Michael Klausner, but I mean, there are, it's not rocket science what I do. It really isn't. But, but, if you want to do what I do, brace yourself. Brace yourself. The emotional price you pay for dealing with innocent victims of tragedy, that is tough. It is tough. It's debilitating. You pick up the newspaper and you pray that nobody died or was physically injured in some tragedy. Because the toughest part of responding to these disasters with some sort of unique creative compensation system is dealing with individual victims and their families. You cannot design and administer these programs without offering any eligible claimant who wants to come and see you an opportunity to be heard. Do not underestimate the importance of process in these cases, you see. Now, in 9-11, I conducted 950 separate hearings with victims and their families. You cannot believe what you hear when you invite an individual to come and talk with you about a lost loved one or an injury. You can't, you think you've heard it all until people come and talk to you. Now, nobody ever comes to talk with me about money. Would that they would. Would that somebody would come in and say, you're giving me one million, you ought to give me two million or three million. No, it's not that simple. People come and talk to me about a lost loved one or an injury with two points in mind. First, to vent about life's unfairness. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my daughter driving a GM automobile. Why her? 19 years old, a first-year law associate at a Richmond law firm, and she's gone. Why? There is no God that could allow this to happen. I want you to tell me. I don't care about the money. I want to know why my daughter's been buried months ago. I want to know why my husband died at the World Trade Center. And there's very little you can say, you see. People want to vent. Mr. Feiberg, I will never again set foot in a church or a synagogue. There is no God that could allow this to happen. Or people want to come to see me to validate the memory of a lost loved one. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my wife at the World Trade Center. We were married for 25 years, and I'd like to start my hearing with you by showing you a video of our wedding 25 years ago. Now, Mr. Jones, you don't have to show me that video. 
it won't have any bearing on compensation at you're going to watch I want you to see what those murderers did to my angel play the video my office in 9-11 was filled to the brim with memorabilia videotapes audio tapes medals ribbons diplomas uh, green cards toys teddy bears I mean, memorabilia that people would bring to the hearing. A law degree. A law degree is a wash. Just hold on and, 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 and prepare yourself for what you're going to hear. And just when you think you've heard it all, you see. Mr. Feinberg, 24-year-old woman comes to see me. Tears streaming down her face. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband at the World Trade Center. He was a fireman. And he left me with our two children, six and four. Now, I see here you're going to give me $2.8 million tax-free. I want it in 30 days. Mrs. Jones, 30 days, I don't know. we got to go to Treasury. This is public money. The, the bureaucracy there, we've got to do our due diligence. They've got to, 30 days, I want my money. I go, Mrs. Jones, why do you need the money in 30 days? Why? I'll tell you why, Mr. Feinberg. I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of our two children. Now they're going to be orphans. I have got to get this money while I still have my faculties to set up a trust to protect their interest. Well, we called down a treasury. We accelerated the money. We got it to her. Eight weeks later, she died. I mean, there's nothing. You just can't believe what you hear, you see. One more. One more. Uh, we have a lot of uh, experts in, the in this room here tonight. What would you do with this? What would you do with this real case? A real case. A lady comes to see me. I thought she was sobbing so I thought she was going to collapse in my office. Mr. Feinberg. I lost my husband at the World Trade Center. He was a fireman. Mr. Mom. He was Mr. Mom. Every day that he wasn't at the firehouse, he was home teaching our six-year-old how to play baseball, teaching our four-year-old how to read, reading a bedtime story to the two-year-old. What a cook! Mr. Feinberg, my husband, Mr. Mom, he cooked all our meals. He was the gardener around the house planting the flowers. Mr. Feinberg, I want to tell you something. The only reason I haven't jumped out a window to join him are three children. But it doesn't matter how much money you give me. It isn't going to matter. My life is over. She leaves. The next day, I get a telephone call from a lawyer in Queens, New York. Mr. Feinberg, did you meet yesterday with the woman with the three kids, six, four, and two, and Mr. Mom? I go, yes. Very, very sad. Very sad. He goes, now look. You got a tough job. I don't envy what you have got to do. I really don't. But I got to tell you, Mr. Feinberg, she doesn't know that Mr. Mom has two other kids by his girlfriend in Queens, five and three. Now, I represent the girlfriend. Now, I'm telling you, when you cut your check with public money, there's not three surviving children. There's five surviving children. But I'm sure you'll do the right thing. Click, he hangs up, you know. You know. <laughs> do you tell her? Do you tell her about the two other kids in Queens? Do you tell this lady about Mr. Mom's other life? Now, that's what keeps you up at 3 a.m., not studying for an evidence exam. 
I mean, that is real. That is real live. This is it. Do you tell this lady or don't you? I didn't tell her. Maybe I should. Well, it's 12 years ago, 13. She must know by now. They must know by now. I'm not, I'm not a family counselor. I don't know all the facts. I'm a federal bureaucrat trying to get money out the door. That's all. And uh, we didn't tell her. We cut one check to her and the three kids. And without her knowledge, we cut a separate check to the girlfriend as the guardian of the two kids. That's it. That's what we do. Now, every time you do one of these programs, every time I make mistakes, you are dealing with very vulnerable people, very emotional people. And no matter what you do, no matter how guarded you try and be, you can't help but make mistakes. In the 9-11 fund, an 81-year-old man crying said to me, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my son at the Pentagon. When the plane hit on 9-11, he escaped. He got out safely. But he thought his sister was trapped. She worked there. He went back into the burning building to look for her. She had escaped through a side door. He died looking for her. And this old man said, Mr. Feinberg, a father should never have to bury a son. Just shouldn't have to bury a son. And I looked at this man, and I said to him, I said, Mr. Jones, this is terrible. I know how you feel. This guy looks at me, nice man. He says, Mr. Feinberg, I want to give you some advice because you're dealing with people like me. Don't ever tell somebody like me that you know how I feel. You have no idea how I feel. And I know you don't mean anything by it and you're trying to empathize, but it's pretentious, it's condescending. Don't do that. You don't know how I feel. I'll never do that again. You learn to shut up, mostly. Empathize. You can empathize, but you better be careful because people are angry and hurt. After the Boston Marathon two years ago, <laughs> a guy calls me and says, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my leg. It got blown off as a result of the marathon. I can't come and see you. I said, that's all right, Mr. Jones. I'll come and see you at the hospital in Boston. So I go up to his hospital room, and I walk in. And there he is lying in bed with a stump, and on his lap is his nine-year-old son, and around the bed, his wife, his mother, and his brother, who happened to be a cop. And I say to this guy, Mr. Jones, I'm here to tell you that you're going to get from this fund that we've set up in Boston, one million $125,000 tax-free. He looks at me. says, you're going to give me a million $125,000? That's what you're going to do. I got a better idea. I got a better idea. You keep the money. Give me my leg back. How's that? How's that for a trade, Feinberg? Give me my leg back. You can have the money. Mr. Jones, I wish I had that power. I don't have that power. All I can do is give you this money and blah, blah, blah. Well, you get out of there as fast as you can. There's nothing you can say, you see. So what I want to emphasize today is we could spend hours talking about the design of these programs, how you determine eligibility, how, what is the methodology for calculating damages, what are the proof requirements, what are the due process requirements. We could do that. But to me, that's sort of template elementary. People say, how do you value lives? 
bad you lives. I'm not a rabbi or a priest. I don't look at the moral integrity of a victim. How can you do that? Maybe a priest can do that. I can't do that. I do what judges and juries do every day in Palo Alto, in California, in every city and town in this country. What would the victim have earned over a lifetime but for the tragedy? Add some amount for pain and suffering and emotional distress equals a very cold mathematical calculation, I must say. Judges and juries do it every day. But judges and juries do it one case at a time. One case at a time. They don't, they don't calculate damages for 2,980 people or 1,200,000 people or 400 GM victims. Judges and juries do it one at a time. I do it collectively, right? And you learn that people who are eligible to get compensation. You, you, you guys can know this, I think. They're not really that interested in how much money they're going to get. They're not. But everybody counts other people's money, you see. Everybody counts other people's money. That's what fuels anger. Mr. Feinberg, you're giving me $4 million tax-free. You're giving my next-door neighbor $5 million. What do you got against my wife? You didn't even know her. And you're giving me a million dollars less? How dare you? Well, Mr. Jones, you, your wife earned $100,000 a year, and the next-door neighbor earned $200,000 a year, and under tort principles taught at Stanford Law School of economic laws, blah, 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 people could care less. You think people care about economic loss? How much am I getting versus my next-door neighbor? That's why these programs, you see, let's keep them rare. Let's make sure they're aberrations. I mean, Joe Grunfest is here. I think I told him this story. In BP, some guy comes up to me in BP and he says, that oil cost me $100,000 I couldn't go fishing. I go, you lost $100,000 because you couldn't fish and sell the fish? I go, that's right. Well, let me see how prove it. We do things with a handshake down here. No, no, no. I'm not paying you $100,000 on a handshake. Do you have tax returns? No. All right. Do you have profit and loss statements? So he comes up with something, some papers written in crayon, but it looked pretty good. So I say to him, I'll never forget this. I'm going to send you a check for $100,000. Now, with it, I'm sending you a 1099 from the IRS. He looks at me. You're going to send that with it? Yeah, I have to. I waive it. You can't waive a 1099. That's something I've got to send you. I, you can't waive my sending it in the mail. You've got to get that with the check. I do? Yeah. Rip up the check and, and rip up my application. I said, what are you, crazy? You, you mean because you're going to get an IRS form, you want me to rip up your claim? Rip it up! Probably never paid taxes in his life. That's the sort of the high drama when you do these cases, you see. So that is sort of why I think that when we talk about unconventional responses, these programs, I think, should remain sort of aberrations. Aberrations. And you never, ever know what you're going to hear. I close my talk. We'll take some questions. But I'll tell you a very interesting one. You guys will love this story. In the 9-11 fund, I had one person out of thousands, 5,300 valid claims. One lady came to see me. I'll never forget this. She comes in, 
And she sits down and she says to me, now, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband at the World Trade Center. And I want to know if what I tell you right now in confidence, will it change your view of how much money I'm going to get? I said, absolutely not. This is confidential. We've already made the calculation. You're going to get about two and a half million dollars. And uh, nothing you say will change my mind. So she says to me, oh, that's good, because I, I, I just want you to know, my husband died. This man was scum. <laughs> he abused me so my whole life, my married life. I thought of killing him myself. And I got to tell you, for me to finally get two and a half million dollars, he's more worth to me dead than he ever was alive. And I am so grateful that this fund, there is justice in this world, that I'm getting this money despite the fact that I hope he rots in hell. And she took the money and left it. I mean, I turn to the staff, I go, now we've heard everything. I mean, I have heard everything when this, this one lady, and that's the... That, that's sort of the interesting part of what I do, but uh, for the most part, it's pretty debilitating. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, and since it's Stanford, I'm assuming we'll get some questions from this pretty distinguished crowd. So let's throw it open. Right there. Mr. Pelosi. Could I ask two? Right now, I don't see a <laughs> groundswell, so okay. sure. <laughs> Uh, a number of years ago, you participated in the Agent Orange matter. Yep. And would you share with us what happened when the uh, plaintiffs, when you met with the plaintiffs? Well, you like that story because you've heard it a couple of times, and you laugh every time you hear about it. <laughs> you know, a mediator has to be an optimist, right? A negotiator. It's so important that you maintain a sense of optimism that if you stick around and negotiate long enough, you'll get the thing done. So the very first day I'm asked to mediate, I'm in the neutral, trying to get the Vietnam veterans class action, 250,000 Vietnam veterans claiming injury due to Agent Orange exposure. So I get them seated, I get their lawyers seated at a conference table with the lawyers for the eight chemical companies, Monsanto, Dow, Hercules, they're all there. So I say to the uh, lawyers for the Vietnam veterans, how much do you want, this is our first day of mediating, how much do you want, what's your demand to resolve this litigation? We've thought about it, Feinberg. We want $1,250,000,000. Okay? Eight chemical companies collectively together You've passed the hat. How much are you willing to spend, offer, to close out this case? Collectively, $25,000. I go, now we're making progress. Now we're closing the gap. Okay. You've got to be optimistic. Now, we're, now that's more like it. Now let's, uh, let's keep working at it and try and... Now, of course, that case, eight weeks later, settled for $250 million, and it was a... Very, it was the largest mass tort settlement of its type ever at the time. And um, you got to stay optimistic. But you've heard that story. That's the fourth time you've heard that story. And you laugh every time. So, uh, <laughs> You're the best. Now, what's uh, your second All question? right. The second is, uh, within the last week, the New York Times had a three-part or four-part piece on mandatory uh, compulsory ar arbitration. Just any comment that you might wish to offer. It's unconscionable. You read that series... The Supreme Court has twice upheld these mandatory arbitration clauses, five to four. Now, when you read that article, I mean, you can say a lot about mandatory arbitration, but the idea that in these consumer contracts on page 53 of your Verizon contract, you can be compelled if you buy a cell phone from Horizon to go to mandatory arbitration uh, as a contract to me, as a clause of adhesion. But I don't think it's a good idea, and I'm a big, big believer in ADR. But um, I see real problems with that. But uh, I'm on the short end right now, at least as the Supreme Court has ruled. So, yes, ma'am.
Well, you're, you're, you're referencing my latest book. I'm glad you mentioned my latest book. <laughs> Who Gets What? My latest book, Public Affairs Press, 2012. Now, you read the book. Now, there are some of you may have trouble finding that book. Don't worry. My personal supply of that book is virtually inexhaustible. <laughs> and if anybody has trouble, we'll get you a copy. Inscribed. Here's what I meant by that. It's very, very important, and in 9-11 we did it, and in, in BP we did it, and in GM we did it. Outreach. Before we finalize the protocol, the terms, the conditions, the rules of this program, of this particular compensation program, we invite comment from the public, from lawyers, from victims. We reach out to everybody. We publicize. This is what I'm thinking of doing. What do you think? How can we make it better? And I talk to the lawyers, and I talk to the victims and their families, and I try and at least a process where we gain input. And we did that in 9-11, BP, GM, uh, Boston Marathon, and, and very successfully. Now, I do make a distinction between the individual hearings. In 9-11, as I told you, we, we held individual hearings to anybody who wanted a hearing, confidential. We couldn't do that in BP, not with a million two hundred thousand claims. And I think that hurt our program. Now, we did provide a million two hundred thousand claimants the opportunity to go into an office in the Gulf. We set up 35 claims offices. Not a hearing, but if you want to talk to a live person, not the same. 9-11 and GM, we invited people to come and talk privately. It made a huge difference in the credibility and the success of the program. I think BP worked out fine, but it was a real challenge because of the volume, and I think that undercut the credibility somewhat of the program. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Feinberg. Now that you've established that there is precedence in the United States for unconventional response, uh, what do the other countries? What do the other countries do? Is there uh, in similar circumstances? No. Or is the United States unique? You're asking the question: Has anybody abroad replicated what we do in the United States? Absolutely not. Now, there's two reasons for that. First. No country in the world has our litigation system. So the alternative in foreign countries isn't the same as in the United States. Secondly, no company, no, no country is anywhere near as generous. I, I went over to London. I was invited by Parliament. In London, after the London bombings, the bus bombings, the subway, 52 dead. So I go over to Parliament. They wined and dined me. It was great. We held a hearing. And the Parliament, the, the, the members of the committee, they say to me, how did it work? Well, here's what we did. We set it up and we gave them a hearing and economic loss. and blah, blah. Wow. Well, we're thinking of doing something like that here, Mr. Feinberg. How much did you pay people? Well, on average, for a death claim in 9-11 was a little over $2 million. What? Two me I was on the next plane home. <laughs> you hear money like this abroad. They have a social safety net, you know, in Europe. And they don't have a litigation system like ours. And where you roll the dice for the pot of gold. It doesn't work that way. And they don't have the same charitable impulse privately because they've grown up and they've had these very mature social government programs, welfare programs, in the event of tragedy. So it's, it's apples and oranges. It's altogether different, America. And I don't think you'll see that these have much value in being a precedent abroad. No. Two more? One more? Go ahead, sir. You refer to yourself as a federal bureaucrat. 
I was surprised to hear that. I thought you were kind of a free agent. Who do you work for, and how has that changed over the years you've been doing this stuff? Well, that's a tough question. Who do I work for? It's a very interesting question. In 9-11, I clearly worked for the United States government because the statute required the Attorney General of the United States to appoint a Justice Department official to design and administer the program, and I got the appointment. So that was sort of straightforward. BP and, and GM, very unclear. In BP, there was no statute. The President of the United States, Obama, shakes hands with BP, and BP agrees to set up a program with an independent administer that Ob the President chose me and, and said, I, let, let Feinberg do it. He'll be independent. Well. BP is paying me. The Justice Department and the White House are appointing me. And the victims are getting paid the money. So I'm not sure who I represented. In GM, GM is paying me. But GM announced to Congress and to the world, uh, we'll pay him, but we have no say in how we resolve the individual cases. So I don't know who I represent. I'm not sure. I finesse it. I don't it, it, it really is a very interesting question for an ethics, a legal ethics class, really. Last question. Uh, thank you. What, uh, what do you see as the implications of the popularity of these special programs about the tort system in general in this country? The tort system is safe. I don't think these programs threaten the tort system at all. First of all, the tort system. Anybody who studies American history, our legal system, the adversary system, the tort system, it's part of American life. It's been that way from the founding, from the founding of the Republic. You know that little book de Tocqueville wrote, Democracy in America? He writes in 1840, you know? It's very interesting in America, traveling around America, I see that every major dispute in America ends up in the courtroom. He said that in 1840. And I think, I think that the tort system in this country, I believe, works pretty well, actually. It works pretty well. Maybe not in the mass disaster cases, but that's the fault of judges that, don't, that, that frown on aggregating the claims so that you can get a resolution fairly quickly. Um, but I think the tort system works pretty well. And even if you think it doesn't, you know, even if you're an academic critic at Stanford Law School and you think the tort system doesn't work well, well, you're tilting at windmills if you think it's going to change. There may be some... Band-Aid reforms at the state level on Med-Mal or capping personal injury in certain cases. But the basic tort system and the adversary system, you choose your lawyer, I'll choose my lawyer, judge and jury, that is so ingrained in the history and fabric of the country that I don't think any 9-11 fund or BP oil spill fund or GM ignition switch fund, I don't think it's going to change anything. And that's why it's always interesting when I attend a tort class and discuss alternatives to the tort system. The 9-11 Fund and these other programs, they, they may be alternatives to litigation, but they're grounded in the tort system. Our methodologies are tort-based when we choose how much somebody's going to get. That's, that's the system. And uh, I'd be very, very uh, wary about... Um, about changing that system. I think these programs are interesting. They, I think they, they sort of capture the imagination short term of the, of the public and the interest of the public. But um, <laughs> they're not going to change the world. And I must tell you, when you're doing the BP program, and somebody calls you up and says, I don't understand. I've been waiting for 19 years, Exxon Valdez. 
I still don't have my money. And you're paying all these BP oil spill. Why don't they get in line? Where's my money? Well, this is only for BP victims. Oh, that really gets you very far. That really, that guy really likes hearing that. Yeah, you're only paying BP? Why aren't you paying Exxon Valdez? Well, no one asked me and blah, 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 blah. So that's, that's what happens. That's why it, it's a good way to end this. I get back to where we began, which is these programs are very interesting. They're certainly worthy of discussion and debate and, and um, exchange of views. But anybody who thinks that if they stick around long enough, this is the way the future looks. I don't think that for a minute, and I'm not really sure that would be a very good idea. I thank Stanford. Mr. Small, I thank you in particular.